I'm Wilson Lai. I'm Benjamin Yap. I'm Eli Sands. You're listening to Deep Cut. On Deep Cut, we compare a director's most popular film with a personal favorite chosen by one of us. We also discuss that director's life in Korea to bring in context that helps us view that movies as they may want us to. On our last episode, we talked about the popular pick from Malian slash Mauritanian director Abderrahman Sisako, which was 2014's Timbuktu. Today, we're going to be tracking backwards a tiny bit and covering Sisako's previous film, which is Bamako. It was made in 2006. If you heard last week's podcast, Bamako was actually fitted in last minute (laughs) as I was making my journey through (laughs) Abderrahman Sisako's filmography. I realized that I had a personal favorite deep cut, and I feel like because Sisako's filmography is so small in terms of feature films, we should take this opportunity to try and share his movies and talk about his movies, all of his movies, because I feel like we can, and I'd be very happy to. So I'm taking over the reins a little bit this week, so we're going to talk about Bamako. Mutiny. (laughs) Wilson saw me dancing with Abderrahman Sisako and stepped in and said, may I have this dance? Hopefully very politely and not in like a snatch Sisako away from you (laughs) sort of way. Yeah, you elbowed me in the rib, dude. (laughs) Well, for that, I apologize, but I don't think I was going to go down without a fight uh, (laughs) to cover this film. (laughs) And this is definitely a different tone or a different rhythm to a lot of other films that we've covered on the podcast. I would say that it is very dense. Yes. It is a very dense film. And even our discussion today, I don't think we'll be able to fully grasp or fully talk about everything that Sisako is trying to do with this movie. Because he is trying to pack a lot in, using this very simple idea, but he is is still trying to pack a lot in. And I think before we go into what this film is, I want to ask Ben and Eli, as you two just finished this movie today, what are your initial thoughts and feelings coming out of this watch? Ben? Oh, man. Oh, sorry. (laughs) I feel like Ben always gets thrown under the bus to give his reaction first. Eli? Eli? I just hide in the wings strategically. I can go first. It's okay. I literally just finished watching this 15 minutes ago. I tried to watch it last night after having a whole day on set. Bad idea. Not the film that you can do that with. No, definitely not. Last week, we talked about how Sisiko talked about himself as not being quite a cinephile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think watching Timbuktu and then watching Bamako, it comes through in that he is an extremely idiosyncratic filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That doesn't subscribe to conventional norms, even within a art cinema space. This feels maybe almost something like working with a video art sensibility almost. And I find it very interesting always when I'm watching art house films that have different sensibilities from the typical stuff, even the typical stuff that is underseen, you know, like even the typical stuff that's more art house. There is like a world art house style or sensibility. Mm. And I see the difference that you're marking here, Ben. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is different from that kind of yeah. global art house style that you're talking about, Eli. I think that makes it a very difficult film to watch in terms of just mm. getting through it. Yeah. There's so much people standing at a podium talking. That's what this film is. My reaction is that while I think it is a powerful argument, my initial reaction is I wonder if this is the right medium for it. Hmm. The thing that I felt like I wanted more from this is the flashes of people living in mm-hmm. Bamako. I kind of yeah. wanted more from that. I find the film description on IMDb slash Letterboxd completely confounding because it spends 90% of that plot summary on the thing that the film is not 90% about. Yeah. In fact, the film is about the last two words of that summary. (laughs) There's a lot of whiplash when you go into a film reading that kind of synopsis and then getting something completely different. It becomes very hard to take in. And I think me wondering about whether it's the correct medium for it is because film is about being in that moment that you are watching or hearing. Yeah. Because this thing spends so much time on many very intellectual arguments against the IMF and the World Bank, 
from the perspective of African society, that stuff is so dense that it is hard to let that kind of information wash over you. And the stuff that's more inviting is actually those personal stories that are scattered throughout, but they're so thin that they don't leave enough of an impression on me. And I did wish there was more of that. Right now, I feel like the kind of two kinds of films that this is are juxtaposed, but not in a way that completely works for me. Hmm. I see what he's trying to do there, but it is so overwhelmed by the argumentative through line of this film Mm -hmm. with the court stuff that I don't see it really working for me anyway to kind of give me an emotional hook to this argument. Because from my perspective anyway, the power of the filmic medium is to give you that emotional hook. Not that it's always necessary, but that's what I think the fragments of real life can do, but they don't quite go there for me. And then I'm wondering what this film can be now. Hmm. So that's kind of my very complicated reaction. It's not really a thumbs up or thumbs down kind of thing. It's just kind of like me wondering about this because Mm -hmm. it's like, I'm not sure how to really access this film because it is so different from what I'm used to. It is a very tough movie. Mm -hmm. I really like the ways in which it makes itself wrinkly and challenging. It's almost not a fair comparison, but I'm reminded of one of my top three picks from 2021, which was The Inheritance by Mm -hmm. Ephraim Asili, which is a very different movie, but it shares a goal in didacticism or making an argument or investigating a social political topic at a very different scale, of course and in very different ways. But whereas The Inheritance very purposefully is breaking up its messaging in these spontaneous character moments, the spontaneous stuff in the trial in Bamako feels like it is separate from those trial moments. Even when it's in the same sequence, Mm -hmm. those reaction shots are the really great part of those sequences. Yeah. I think I find it more successful than you're describing, Ben, but I do see what you're saying. I also went into this movie with the knowledge that a lot of what the lawyers say is directly pulled from real trials. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess the splitting or the disconnect between the two sides of the movie, being the trial side and the more narrative-based stuff, is actually very clear when you realize that Sisiko shot all of the trial stuff documentary style. Mm. He would roll four cameras and have a sound recordist. Like, if you saw the movie, you would see these camera operators and the sound recordist because they were shown on camera. They wanted everyone, including the lawyers that represent the prosecution, the African people that are trying to do or charge the IMF and the World Bank, they're played by real lawyers that fight for African folk on a daily basis. Like, that's their job. Mm -hmm. Also, the people that go up and testify, they are real people. And they are answering these questions, and they are talking about their lives in a non-scripted way. So everyone's just acting like this trial is going on. So it's sort of like an exercise in documentary filmmaking on that one hand, but all the narrative stuff shot outside of the trial is shot storyboarded with single camera. So I feel like it makes sense that it is supposed to feel disconnected, but I think playing with that disconnect, placing the trial directly in the courtyard of the house, he's sort of slamming these two things, one being a system that is very westernized, that is one that is very intellectual and crowding that system within the lives, the very basic lives of these people. When you think about it in a more big picture kind of way, and and that's where I was like sort of really gravitated towards, it becomes a really fascinating, unique exercise and like a really political art act. The fact that it is a documentary, like a capturing of this, trial makes it essential to be on film as well knowing that these moments are real like people are actually pleading like of course the stakes aren't that high but people are actually pleading for their lives and for money and for these institutions to get condemned and i think that's what was so powerful and moving and the general indifference that the local people have towards trial as well was so fascinating to me 
I actually want to walk back some of what I said earlier. I think it may help me to say what my favorite moment in the movie is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Towards the end of the movie, as the trial is coming to a head, an elderly man who we've seen in some reaction shots stands up and starts singing and walking towards the podium Mm -hmm. and pointing an implement that he has, which is a handle with a brush attached to it. This sequence goes on for maybe like five minutes. It's very patient. We see him sing. We see him gesticulate with his brush. We see the reaction shots of everyone around him. Everyone's quiet and watching. The people outside are listening. It is the meshing of all the things that the movie is doing in one moment. It just happens. You can tell what the guy's feeling. What he's singing is not subtitled. You just get it. That's maybe the most important moment for me. And it captures all the levels of what Bamako is, I believe. Yeah, in a sort of wordless way, it is. Well, I, in an unsubtitled way, <laughs> hmm. where you, you don't understand the content, but you understand the emotion and you understand the pain. Yeah. I think just to respond to what Wilson was saying about why it works because of the kind of documentary style of filming those court sequences and this moment that you reference, Eli, I think this is kind of why I think this might not work for me. Mm. Mm. I would love to investigate my own feeling about this as we talk about this and get through some context that might help me. But just my initial reaction is that, yes, it is filmed in a documentary style and it makes it feel organic. But then that moment sticks out for me because it feels planned and a little scripted, even though it might not be. But also just the whole conceit of the trial, which feels very metaphorical, Mm -hmm. doesn't feel real and lived in. And so there is a very strong dissonance watching this where you know this is off, that something is wrong here. The, The fact that he places this trial, this very westernized looking trial within this village, and you know this doesn't seem like a real thing. And then you have it being shot in a real way. And then you have these extremely eloquent speeches by the lawyers, which feel very, very written. Even if it's performed in one take, it is very scripted. And then a moment like this that comes at the end that feels also very chronologically convenient for the kind of feeling it should give off. Mm -hmm. Hmm. There's still a falsity here that doesn't work for me. Would you say it's like a problem of stakes? I don't think it's about stakes. It's about... I think the large question for me is like, what are you trying to say, right? Like, and I think for me, with very little context, hard to grasp. The film doesn't give you the context to grasp exactly what it's trying to say because there are some things that are off about it. And the indifference of the people is one of those things that is kind of dissonant as well because you have a very passionate argument against the World Bank and IMF, but then also that indifference undermines it a lot. But I don't want to get too much into it. I think we should listen to some context and maybe it'll help us crystallize these things. Let's hope that what I'm about to say helps with your understanding or, I don't know, changes the way that you see the film. But also, I feel like I wouldn't recommend this film to, like, anybody. Like, I wouldn't be like, oh, you, you're you interested yeah. in African cinema? Like, let me show you a, like, a two-hour movie where people are talking in a court. But I do think that there are really interesting ideas here at play. Let's talk some context first. While researching this film, because I really had no clue as to how I would approach it, I looked at two interviews, that one that he gave with off screen an online magazine and one that he gave to spirituality practice which <laughs> i think looks very christian to me but i don't know why they interviewed him and also an article by Hejumala Olananyen, who was a nigerian academic and was also a professor at a uh, university of wisconsin madison and taught english and african And his article that he wrote was entitled Of Rations and Rationalities, The World Bank, African Hunger, and Abderrahman Sissako's Bamako. You can find it online if you do a little Google search. It puts really clearly, I think, the struggle that Sissako is trying to take a stand against or say something against in this and how his approach, I guess, in any other hands would not be as elevated and won't be as nuanced as Sissako with his background and is also with his own directorial sensibilities rather than making my own description i would i'm just gonna lift what olanian wrote in his article bamako is a film that realizes in cinematic representation a conceit no doubt many africans have at one time or at another imagined or dreamed of even if as mere relieving jest 
put the IMF and World Bank and all their allies, local and foreign, on trial for their impoverishment of Africa in the name of helping it. So the court, which is presided over by African judges, is set in the yard of an ordinary house in Bamako, Mali. The lead lawyers for the prosecution and defense, both white, vigorously argue their cases. This is a poignant proceeding for while the crimes against the accused, the composite effects of the structural adjustment programs, are there for everyone to see. They are, in the language of the system, Euro-American, of justice at play, intangible or simply theoretical in terms of cause and effect. It is not surprising, then, that the defendant itself, the World Bank, is not present in court. Yeah. A spectrum of Africans, a professor, a writer, a farmer, all give moving testimonies for the prosecution. But while such testimonies may produce sympathy, they could hardly deliver justice. This drama plays out against the backdrop of the progressive disintegration of the marriage of the young couple, the bar singer, Mele, and her unemployed husband, Chaka. Okay, that is a mouthful, <laughs> but <laughs> I think that is a good explanation of what this movie does in its runtime. And to put more context into the idea that the IMF and the World Bank fucked over Africa some more information about the structural adjustment programs that they introduced in the 1980s. In the 1980s, one country after another country were forced to adopt these structural adjustment programs in order to qualify for loans. So this is like individual, but also collective. And these structural adjustment programs would include uh, removals of subsidies. So that would control the price of milk, sugar and petrol. Another structural program was a reduction in national spending and social programs such as education, health, and transportation. And this is a structural adjustment program that we heard about at length during this trial. Basically, the poor became poorer, a lot of economies declined, and infrastructure decayed. This is a modern form of colonialism, which is another idea that Sisiko feels intrinsically tied to. Mm -hmm. Sisako himself, in an interview, said that his reason for making this film, well, first of all, his first reason of making his film is he wanted to make a film that was set in his father's home court in Bamako. So the film takes place in his family court. Another reason that he wanted to make this movie was because he wanted to make a film that has to do with his own views on Africa. He says... Africa, not as the continent that I call my own, but as a place of injustice which directly affects me. When one lives on a continent where filmmaking is difficult and uncommon, one feels entitled to speak in the name of others. Faced with the seriousness of the situation in Africa, I felt a kind of urgency to bring up the hypocrisy of the North towards the Southern countries. So another big thing that Sisako said in an interview struck me as really interesting is that he said that this film, Bamako, was not made for local African audiences. The intention of this film was to show it to the West. Like, his intended audience were Western audience members. Maybe that could be a starting off point for a discussion about, I guess, more of the themes and also of the, the form of which Sisiko is playing with in this movie. Do you think that this film is effective in explaining the situation or explaining the pain that results from the situation. I, for one, didn't realize that it was that serious and it was also that structural and that both sides, like African leaders and also leaders of these organizations, were both working together to basically steal money from African people and African nations and their lives. That fact, I, th I guess it was really new to me. And, and I think I really saw this idea of international aid in a different light after. I also did not know about the details of how structural it was. I'm not surprised, which I don't say to champion my cynicism or anything, but it was really helpful to know more about the details of how the World Bank and IMF take advantage of African nations and people. 
To me, it does a good job of explaining these concepts and making it clear what's at stake Mm -hmm. in a very large scale. I'm also interested in the ways in which Sisako is aware of how Western audiences are going to perceive this movie. And he talks about this in interviews, too, of whenever he gets the question of something like, what do you represent as an African filmmaker? He resents that broadness. Mm -hmm. Here, he engages with that in playful ways. Notably, he's sending up the Hollywood Western Mm -hmm. in this incredible passage Mm -hmm. where he has Danny Glover, Elias Suleiman, a Palestinian filmmaker, and himself (laughs) all cast in this almost a side in the movie that feels pretty pointed in how it's talking about the ways in which Hollywood movies would view the stakes of this conflict as individual actors, as about immediate physical danger, Mm. rather than something structural and holistic. Right. And in its end, ending in pure destruction and death. Yeah. A lot of this still loops back to my kind of central question when I look at this film of whether it is the right medium for it, because something like that is so explosive, but the subtlety of it is very hard to grasp unless you really like think about it almost like a text, like mm-hmm. with words. Yeah. The arguments work better when you can read them mm. and you can kind of parse them. Mm. Interesting. And like the idea of this satirical Western works better when you lay it out on a table and talk about how it works as a parody and about how it elucidates the way that the Western perspective might see this issue. The immediate watching of it, so much of it is going to go whoosh for me (laughs) that I wonder if this is for the Western audience, then it might just have a similar effect. Well, taking for granted that Sisako is aware of how dense it is, Mm -hmm. why might he be making it harder to watch or digest the intellectual argument even as he's making that a huge component of the movie yeah maybe the answer is in those reaction shots and the ways in which we're seeing everyone internalize these thoughts he does say in an interview that he did include this aside where it's sort of a cowboy short film because he thinks audiences would get bored watching a courtyard setting for 30 or 40 minutes. <laughs> and he basically was trying to make something that could help the film breathe a little, but also at the same time would be content that would show a metaphor of what he wanted to tell in the film as a whole, hmm. which is a domination of a group or of a vision of the world more than an identity. And that's why he cast both white and black cowboys. Blood is on everyone's hands. Mm-hmm. Not everyone, but the people in power. I really want to talk about this idea that Pejumola Olanian puts forth in this article that this film is at its heart about rations and rationalities. The rations part of it is very clear, right? That's the, that's the fun. That's resources. The necessities needed in order to have a good livelihood. The rationalities part of it is what Olanian describes as the court proceeding. He writes that the film is also very much about rationalities, meaning the reasonings, the logics around which we organize and have organized our world, the rationales and justifications we offer to ourselves to understand how rations have been and are being rationed in the world, and how resources could possibly have been and still be rationed differently. It is about who can talk about rations and in what language, and who cannot. It is about the comparative power of the ideas about how we have rationed our one world. And above all, given this film's emphasis on the systematic presentation of opposing viewpoints in a modern, westernized judicial process with a stereotypical stress on rational argumentation, the film appears to be saying that there is indeed an important relationship between rations and rationalities. What exactly is the nature of this relationship that the film is suggesting us? Who knows? Can ration and rationality, apparently close as they are, really coexist? And in what relations of power? I think there's just a lot of questions at play there that Sisiko leaves for us in our heads to make conclusions about. Mm. I think it's done really simply by having the decision to just place the trial in the context of this courtyard and the town surrounding it and the people surrounding it. Sisiko himself is able to 
rely on what I think is one of his strongest directorial traits, which is establishing a sense of place and a sense of space Hmm. Hmm. and a sense of the people living in a space just through like silence, just through being there. Using that to speak, I would argue, just as loudly as the people at the podium, even when given much less screen time. I agree, too. There is something so important about the place being a sort of foil for the rules and (laughs) procedures of the trial, which are, of course, very Western. And the tactility and immediacy of everyday life and people undermines those rules as sort of silly Mm -hmm. and small and irrelevant. There's a whole point when a lady is at the podium talking about how a village had to move away from the railroad because of the privatization of that railroad. And she has seen proof of conspiracy to privatize the railroad. But the rules are such that she can't present that as evidence in court. Mr. Rappaport, the lawyer, leaps down her throat and winds up getting away with it because that's the rules. Mm. Other things like the school teacher who goes to the podium and remains silent the man who sings that we've already discussed, the woman who dyes cloth for a living coming into the court space and yelling at some of the lawyers representing IMF and the World Bank. These are things that are not admissible as evidence or argument to the legal procedure, but they're a part of the movie because those are part of the argument that Sasako wants us to walk away with, to understand the pain that his characters and countrymen live with. I'm starting to zero in on a different way of looking at this film. Because when we look at this film and like kind of what its themes are about, it sounds like a film that's trying to give us an idea of the injustices at play. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. When we think of films like that, we always think of them as films with a certain kind of call to action. But this is not a film with a call to action. This is a film that I think has more of an anthropological bent. I want to go back to my point that I made in the previous episode, that Sisako's films reminded me a lot of the work of Frederick Wiseman, mm. near and dear to our heart. Mm-hmm. This film, in particular, screamed a lot like uh, a recent Wiseman film that I watched, and a Wiseman masterpiece, which was his film called Welfare, which is set in this welfare office, and how all these people come into this welfare office and are basically making a case for them to maintain food stamps. And basically carry on living life. You see these people trying to coherently in this office and and very like calmly, as calmly as they can, try to beg for their lives, basically. This instance in Bamako where you have these people making a case for themselves in maybe a scripted, in a really maybe scripted way or maybe a really not scripted way, through the image, I could really feel the real emotion behind it that I feel like I wouldn't have felt if it wasn't as staged in a documentary setting as it is. I think that William Bourdon, the prosecutor on the side of the African nations, during his speech at the end where they give their closing remark, he gives a really, really impassioned speech. And you can see the reactions of the people watching more intently than before and even some people drying their eyes as he tries to make a case for them, you can really feel in that moment, they feel like they're being heard. They feel like their cries and their pleas are hopefully getting sent across continents so other people can understand the injustices Mm. that they face. Even though this trial is not resulting in anything real, it creates an opportunity for an emotional connection for a viewer and the person that's making their case in front of the camera. To that point, I have two small quotations from interviews with Sisako. One is from this interview with Kwame Anthony Apia from the African Film Festival sometime in the early to mid-2000s, which I cited in our last episode. Sisako says... Quote, so I portray people nobody else would portray, but my intention is not to give them a voice, not to speak up for them, but to convince myself of the necessary frailty of human life. End quote. Hmm. The next quotation is from a Vice interview with Sisako that he gave around the release of Timbuktu. And he says, quote, with all my films, I don't want to provoke any activities. 
each person makes a film the way he wants, but there should not necessarily be a goal to it. Mm. Timbuktu is not a political campaign to convince someone of something. It was not made to force people to do something. End quote. On that second quote that you gave, Eli, this idea that he's not trying to provoke action is really interesting to me because when we think of films about injustice, there, there tends to be a feeling like it's trying to make you feel something or do something or to see the world in a different way. And I think with this and also with Timbuktu, it feels more of an index of how life is like. And I think maybe the value of Bamako is that it is showing you that juxtaposition of Africa being thrust into a global system like the IMF yeah. or the World Bank and what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And literally what that looks like is a court in the courtyard of his father's place. And I think that is very interesting. And is it necessarily an engaging movie that's really up to debate? Yeah, that is definitely up to the debate. <laughs> but it is very interesting to think about. And I think Sisako is looking at his films in this kind of constructive way of trying to create an image or an idea that is evocative to think about. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily to sit through, but to kind of look at and to deconstruct in this kind of the way that we are doing now. Because if you think about what this film is doing and the audience it has, this is an extremely niche art cinema film <laughs> yeah. that at best is able to spread the kind of thing that he's trying to show to a bunch of global cinema film festivals. Mm -hmm. And then that's kind of it. Like <laughs> that, not messaging, but that thing that he's showing is really only going to go so far. So honestly, its value is that it, as a film, hopefully with the right preservation, <laughs> <laughs> is able to hold that kind of picture for as long as possible. That when you look back and, and think about what Africa went through yeah. in that context with the World Bank and IMF that you can see this thing that kind of is a metaphor or an image that is able to capture what is it was like for Africans to go through something like this with such global reach and repercussions that you might not have with traditional media that might not be able to show you what that is like. So then you have this thing that's almost... You could even say this has a magical realism thing, but the magic is boring <laughs> court stuff. <laughs> exactly. Because right? why is the court in the courtyard? Exactly. I think that's kind of interesting to think about it that way. And I know interesting is not the most interesting word to use, but... <laughs> Ooh. It's okay. I yeah. use interesting all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Ben, I think that's really well said. I agree. I have a perfect physical quote to, to back that up. <laughs> back that up. <laughs> so, Sisako went to interview an old judge in order to prep for this film. And the judge said to him this thing. He said, you must not think that your film will change things, but at least they will know that we know. Oh. Sisako con continues on and he says, and in this sense, I would say that he understood that this film addressed outsiders first of all, but it is inevitably addressing Africa as well. This is to say it must speak, comma, have a voice. Yep. Yeah. If anything, it becomes a public record of like feelings. Mm. Yeah. It might not evoke feeling, but it's like a record of feelings, which is interesting and strange. It's pretty wild. Yeah. <laughs> when we were talking about the type of movie that this is, it crossed my mind that this has some of the qualities of a video essay. There mm. are moments when speakers at the podium are talking about facets of life that have been defunded. So she'll talk about healthcare and it cuts to the man who's sick. Talk about education and cuts to a woman with her child. But now I'm thinking about it in a slightly different way, which is that this is a testimonial film. Testimonial is part of a legal trial. It is a documentation of what happened verbally. Mm -hmm. We think about testimony as something that describes a bad event that happened to preserve it for future knowledge. I think that this movie slots in there exactly. Mm. It's a testimonial of those feelings, as you're saying, Ben. It's a testimonial of the fact that this crime was understood in its time. There's no plausible deniability. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's another important facet of this movie. It is a very firm and clear explanation and accusation of the wrongdoing yeah. of the IMF and World Bank and myriad other powers mm -hmm. that take advantage of African nations. It really is a movie that requires us to bring in context to help us view it. Oh! As the filmmaker wants us to. 
<laughs> I see. I see what you're doing there. Wow. Killing the onion. We're getting to the core of what this podcast is, guys. <laughs> Finally cracking the code after three seasons. <laughs> I think the narrative stuff, while quite a drastic shift happens when you, you get out of this documentary sphere, I think it's thematic focus on like the slow death of everybody Mm. which is sort of a feeling and a tone that is echoed through all of Tizuko's films set in Africa at least I think it compounds really well with all of the trials most explicitly it is shown when Chaka commits suicide at the end of the film due to not being able to find work let's let's just say that that's like the clearest explanation as to why he's not doing that but I feel like there's a lot of other places that you see the this idea of slow death coming in and how country as a whole is just dying you could think about Falai who is the videographer that you meet in the early stages of the, of the film where he's shooting a wedding that goes through the middle of the courtyard and he says that he actually is making a lot more money shooting funerals instead of weddings and mm. you can talk about Samba, who was the lady who was making the clothes and shouted at the defenders and the the court when she was walking through and she gets a health checkup halfway through the film and the doctor says that she has a 140 blood pressure, which is, I guess, really good for them, but it's actually not a, like, not a good blood pressure level. Like, I think there's (laughs) a lot of, like, quiet things there that is, like, these people are not okay. They're, they look fine. They look like they're going about their daily life, but there is sort of a stagnancy there. And there is death around every corner. And it feels like that's just the tone and the pace. And that's the Africa that Sisiko wants you to see and comprehend. Well said. I totally feel that tone across his movies. I think while we're having a tougher time talking about this movie, I do you think that it deserves its rightful place in the deep cut canon or mm-hmm. even the international film canon? World cinema canon. I wrote this in my first review of Bamako, and I remember being in college and being a part of this group that chose films to play in our college film series, which would be like theater that played movies from Wednesdays to Saturdays. There would be a mix of art house, popular movies, the sorts. It was sort of the best place to watch movies in, I don't know, the middle of Connecticut. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. It was the best place. Many memories there. And I was very lucky to be given a a place on the board to decide the films for two of my four years at Wesleyan. And my first year, we were talking about putting African films on the series because there historically had been a large lack of African films or even films from the Middle East that we didn't even show on the film series or were, were very lacking there. And I brought up Bavako and our white faculty advisor immediately dismissed it and said that, oh, that boring court movie, <sighs> we're not playing that. And because of that, it was never pursued, and I don't think we even played an African film that film series calendar. I don't know what I'm trying to say, but I, I do think that moment where there was like a quick dismissal by, I don't know, a white man about this movie that I guess inherently is about how everyone fucked over these African nations just made me a little bit mad. Because I do feel like even though that this is a hard sell... I think the people that would have went to this movie and saw it on a big screen would have really benefited from it. Yeah. Like how, I don't know, I went and saw Timbuktu not knowing anything about it and really benefited from that the first time I saw it at the film series. I feel like this could have been an intellectually stimulating but also emotionally connecting work that taught you about the injustices that were happening in the world. And I do think that this movie is special i could definitely say that's special and it's unique and it's trying to say something that no other movie that i've seen has been trying to say so i'm glad that it's here and i'm glad that we had the chance to also talk about it on the podcast. 
Totally agreed. I mean, I would even go so far as to say that if anything, this is the kind of film that would be perfect to be dissected within a film class. Yes. Rather than just being projected, because it's the kind of movie that requires discussion to fully engage with. It would do it one better to not just screen it, but to actually include it in some kind of film study syllabus to kind of broaden the ways that we can understand what a film can be like. Mm. Ah, why not? Yeah. If you are listening to this and you are teaching a, uh, a film program of any sort, do consider adding this film to your syllabus. Wilson, you're being very diplomatic and not saying this faculty member's name. <laughs> I know we have to bleep it out, but say it. Say his name. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah! <laughs> Boo! <laughs> he was mean to me in my thesis feedback. He was mean to me too. He said one of the meanest things anyone has ever said to me. <laughs> I feel like everyone does not have a good <laughs> memory. We have all been personally attacked. We actually have. <laughs> we know more people who have been. <laughs> Uh, okay, anyway. <laughs> and this review is dedicated to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad that we decided to go further into Susako's filmography than just the deep cut pick that's coming next week. Because Bamako is a really, as you said, special and unique movie. And I do hope that more people watch it. Yeah. And it's Susako's only film that's available on Criterion Channel. So grab it while it's hot. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening to this episode of Deep Cut. Please rate and review because that helps us keep making the show. Be sure to subscribe to us where you listen to podcasts so you'll know when our next episode drops. Keep up with Deep Cut on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Letterboxd at Deep Cut Pod. Join us to talk about movies on our Discord server, which you'll find a link in the description. Thank you to Justina Yam for our beautiful artwork. I'm Wilson. I'm Ben. I'm Eli. Take care. And we're looking forward to talking about more movies with you next time.